Hi, and welcome to Ones and Twos, FP's economics podcast. Every week we take a couple of data points, we use them to try to explain the world. I'm Cameron Abadi, FP's deputy editor with you in Berlin, Germany. As always, Adam Twos, FP's economics columnist and Columbia University professor, is with us in New York. Hi, Adam. Hi, Cam. So, in the second half of the show, we will be talking about teachers. It's that season, back to school. We'll be talking about some of the problems that have arisen. But first, something from the news. And the data point there is 10,760. That is the population of the town of Jackson, Wyoming, a small town in one of the more sparsely populated states in the United States. But the world's attention, specifically the attention of financial elites around the world, are uh, tuned to this small town. Because this weekend, the area of Jackson Hole will be hosting the annual Jackson Hole Economic Summit that the U.S. Federal Reserve is organizing there. And not only central bankers from the United States, but from elsewhere in the world will be attending. This seems to be our bread and butter when Jerome Powell is hosting a party. We're going to be tuning in. They come for two and a half days of eco-nerd talk about math-dense academic papers. They meet in this functional conference room. Not quite the same as the electronically wired, mahogany-paneled Fed conference room back in Washington. For Global Wall Street, it's not about the conversations or the accommodations, but the implications. Yeah, Adam, just to zoom out a bit, what exactly is the history of the Jackson Hole Symposium? How long has the Fed been holding an annual meeting in this national park in, in, the, in the West? Well, the crucial thing here is that the Fed is a system, right? So when we talk about the Fed, we generally speaking mean the uh, Fed board in D.C. But the Fed is made up of member banks, and there are reserve banks across the U.S. The most important of those is in New York. But there's also one in San Francisco, Minneapolis, and there's one in Kansas City. And the Jackson Hole Conference is not hosted by the Federal Reserve, as in the Federal Reserve in D.C. It's hosted by the Kansas City Reserve Bank. In other words, the local branch of the Federal Reserve System. And the series started in 1978 after um, the president of the Kansas City Reserve Bank attended a conference at another regional reserve bank, thought this was a great idea, a good way of promoting um, his Federal Reserve District. And the first few were held in Kansas City, and they were all about agriculture. So the business of the Federal Reserve District that Kansas City um, represents, if you like. The, the Fed is organized in this decentralized way because when the Fed was set up in 1913, the United States economy was very differentiated. And so, right, you needed reserve banks that represented the great agricultural regions of the country, the great manufacturing regions and the great financial centers. So anyway, the Kansas City Reserve Bank started organizing these conferences. They were very well attended. More people attended those early conferences than uh, attended the ultra exclusive events today. Then they were in Vail and then Denver. And the idea was to build the series into a really major you know, shingle for the Kansas City Reserve Bank. And so the idea was to attract the biggest name you could possibly attract. And that was Fed Chair Paul Volcker, the legendary man who was stopping inflation in its tracks with this epic interest rate increase, hugely controversial at the time. So in 1982, they set their sights on getting Volcker to actually come to this regional Federal Reserve System meeting. And the thing everyone knew about Volcker was that he was a passionate fly fisherman. And so if you were going to have a conference in the late summer that Paul Volcker was going to come to, there better be good fishing. So they thought hard about maybe doing it Colorado. And then they realized that at that time of year, the fishing wasn't quite so good. And so that's why they picked Jackson Hole, Wyoming. Um, it's in the Teton National Parks. And it was the success in attracting Paul Volcker in 82 to face some very stiff criticism. That early meeting is legendary because it set the tone for what are often really quite hard hitting meetings. Um, pulling him in in 82 really set the series in motion and it's been running annually ever since. And it really is de rigueur, absolutely essential for central bankers from around the world to attend. You're describing a very strange system. I mean, these, these, these centralized central banks... They compete against each other for status and for kind of like renowned, get the attention. You know, it's like a league, like you okay. know, friendly franchises competing with each other for status. You know, there's ambitious economists mm. and regional central bankers in each case who are vying for visibility. Mm. And yeah, they wanted to, you know, hang out a sign saying we do economics in, in the Kansas City Reserve District as well. And hey, there's good fishing. So come along. Got it. 
So these days, who gets invited to attend exactly? And I'm, I'm interested in this because I do notice that the Fed recently has talked about adopting more political and kind of democratic, small d democratic goals, like racial equality, combating climate change even. I mean, do civil society representatives of issues like this, do they ever get an invitation out to Jackson Hole? Well, the crucial thing is to understand what this conference is about. I mean, it really is more like an insider's meeting of the most technocratic variety devoted to the mechanics of monetary policy in the broader sense of the word. So the circle of people who get invited is really small. It's about 100 to 120, maybe you know, averaging about 110. They are diverse in the sense that they're from all over the world, but they're not at all diverse in the sense that they're either economists or central bankers, one or the two, or maybe regulators in some cases. That's it. Right? And the participants give papers, like properly worked out, pre-distributed, highly academic, technical economics papers, and then they comment on them. And you're either there listening to the economics chat, or you are giving a paper, or you're commenting on a paper. And that's kind of the mechanics here. So it's central bankers from around the world, literally from everywhere, have attended over the years. Um, and then an uber elite of macroeconomists and monetary economists, largely from the top American universities. So this is not a political stage. This is not a Davos. This is not a trade fair in which, as it were, representation is the key. And as it were, you assemble platforms that represent various stakeholders or civil society in any sense. It is a self-consciously exclusive highly technocratic expert meeting in which quite serious conversations about technical issues of economic policy take place and central bankers take positions. Another group that are invited are the top economics journalists from the most influential global financial media. They're also part of this. So no, civil society groups are not part of the inner meeting. That doesn't prevent them from attending. And in recent years, campaigns like the group Fed Up or 350.org campaigning on climate issues, have lobbied the meeting. They've gone to Jackson Hole and they've they've had protests outside the resort. Okay, so almost an academic conference you're describing. And so what is the logic of holding it then in such a remote location? I mean, what can be accomplished out in Jackson Hole that, that just can't be done at headquarters or, I don't know, online? Well, I mean, you know, we've got to go back to basis. I mean, Kansas City, the Reserve Bank is hosting. So their choice of resorts is Kansas City, Colorado or Wyoming. And it may strike urbanites like us, Cam, as a kind of a weird thing to do. But in fact, going to highly remote mountainous settings in which there's great fishing and skiing at certain times of year is something people do. They really do. I, I gotta hate to break it to you, but like and so Jackson Hole Airport is in fact the largest and busiest commercial airport in Wyoming. And Jackson has become a second home for an entire roster of celebrities like Sandra Bullock, RuPaul, Kanye West, Kim Kardashian, Harrison Ford, Dick Cheney, Christy Walton, the Walmart heiress. They all have mega mansions in Jackson, in Wyoming. Uh, The tax regime is incredibly favorable to extreme wealth and the settings are stunning. So you can see these central bankers in their nerdy combinations of suits and sneakers sort of staring in disbelief at these giant mountains that are surrounding them. And then they get, um, you know, invited in the evenings to swanky parties in people's giant mansions. Jackson itself is is a fairly freaky place. It's in fact the metropolitan area in the United States with the most extreme inequality because at one end you have top 1% of the residents of the Jackson Hole Valley uh, have an average earned income of $16.2 million, an average earned income for the top 1%, which is 132 times more the average income of the bottom 99% of families. Um, Housing in Jackson Hole is about twice the national American average. The rental on the two-bedroom apartment is three times that of Wyoming as a whole. So it's a community that really starkly represents the extreme inequalities of American society. On the one hand, private jets, and on the other hand, people living in trailers. The entire world will specifically be tuned into the speech that Jerome Powell is scheduled to give at the conference itself. I mean, markets pretty much are guaranteed to move in response to his choice of words. And and that got me wondering about how do Powell's speeches get written in the first place, Adam? I mean, how, how much autonomy does the Fed chief have in deciding how to describe what the bank's policy is? I think the thing to understand is just how technocratic the Fed is as an agency. Like, I mean, it, it, the board in D.C., not the regional banks, the board alone employs 400 PhD economists. So formulating doctrine, the precise wording of their stance on any given issue is hugely technical. 
like dozens and dozens of PhD economists crank the numbers, work their brains on the issue of is our positioning this way or that? And the way in which the Fed's statements are issued literally morphs. They will move a single word in a statement with regard to their outlook, for instance, and then AI across the world in the financial markets of the world will pass the fact that they've moved a single word. So it's highly constrained at, at that level. On the other hand, when Powell gets before the cameras, what he says is up to him, right? And the at that moment, his, his degree of freedom is enormous, and the price that he would pay for screwing up is huge as well. So Ben Bernanke in his relatively forthcoming memoirs about his experience of transitioning from being a very high-powered monetary economist who would periodically get invited to Jackson Hole to becoming a governor, uh, to being on the board of, of the Fed and then becoming, of course, the chair, describes this as a transition from being something that he always looked forward to going to to, be, to being something of an ordeal. Um, as he says, you know, it was became something of a chore to go to Jackson Hole. I was always happy to talk economics, but it's difficult to have useful free-flowing discussions in the glare of intense media coverage. I was acutely aware that any slip would be echoed and amplified, so I limited my participation to delivering my prepared remarks. Um, Greenspan became famous for whispering his approval or disapproval of the papers giving at Jackson Hole to the paper givers in over coffee afterwards so that no one could hear what position he was taking. So it's extremely constrained. Yeah, I mean, it's remarkable power concentrated in words uh, that are delivered. Yeah, it's kind of papal almost, I think. You know, it really does feel like the papacy. Uh, are there ever people who are central bankers who kind of embrace that power to just kind of freewheeling, take questions and just sort of embrace the power that they have in that way. Mario Draghi's whatever it takes moment is the classic moment of precisely that sort of self-empowerment, an act of sovereignty, really, in the technical sense, because the whatever it takes declaration in the summer of 2012 in London, it's not obvious how far that was scripted. It may have been somewhat off the cuff, um, provoked by the Eurosceptic conversation he'd sat through in the hours before. And it wasn't backed by um, actual agreements within the European Central Bank system on what the ECB would be authorised to do. And so there was a degree to which he simply went out on the limb and drove the agenda that way. I think that's why that statement by him has become, by Mario Draghi, has become so iconic, really, of this new power that the financial system confers on central bankers. So, so finally, I wanted to ask about... CEOs who might be attending this conference. It sounds like it's mostly academics and central bankers, but occasionally, I suppose, capitalists uh, arrive at conferences like this. And I, I wonder what is the kind of interaction then between the capitalists and the academics? Well, this was one of my preconceptions about Jackson Hole that was busted in the process of doing the research, because I went back through the transcripts of previous meetings, and they have a list of the accredited participants. And what's astonishing is just how few bankers ever attend. Um, the only meeting at which a significant crop did, as far as I could tell recently, uh, was the 2009 meeting after the financial crisis, which was on financial stability. And no doubt in that context, it made sense to hear from you know, the CEO of JP Morgan, for instance, and some senior bank economists were there as well. But in other meetings recently, no senior bankers from the private sector have attended. It really is an exclusive meeting between central bankers, regulators, and economists. The hobnobbing with capitalists seems to take place outside the conference setting immediately in the facility of Jackson Hole. So for a long time anyway, the a former CEO of Goldman Sachs, who happens to have a mansion in Jackson Hole, would invite the entire conference for dinner on Saturday night at the end of proceedings. So it was a sort of more social interaction. Well, James Wolfenson, who was the former uh, president of the World Bank, also has a mansion there. And so I gathered that on, I think, on Friday night, that the entire conference was in the habit of meeting at his place. So it's that kind of setting. It's more like a, a, a gathering on a, you know, a fancy campus rather than really the sort of Davos style encounter between various sorts of expertise and the business elite. I have to say it was, it's very eye opening to actually dig into this because it has this huge prominence in global commentary on monetary policy, but it's a, a much uh, weirder event than I really appreciated. I wonder whether that itself is sort of an expression of where the power really lies. If the capitalists are simply saying, oh, you have your little conference and then I'll convene you all afterwards at my home. You know, um, I, we don't need to attend the actual uh, uh, sessions here. Um, we're happy to just 
chat afterwards. Or maybe it's the opposite. Maybe this is really Jackson Hole is the real representation of academic power. Maybe this is where academics are, are really in the driver's seat in, in, in global financial politics for a moment. It's a very interesting sort of division of labor, I think. It's really a remarkable example of the way in which technocracy, really, in a relatively pure sense, um, operates, as you say, however, framed by you know, the brute force reality of money and wealth and tax incentives and private jets and all of that, which which are the other reality of Jackson Hole. Yeah, it's odd for me to picture the sort of interaction between celebrity culture and academics sort of conference without some connective tissue there. There's some, some odd sort of... Yeah, they, they <laughs> literally had meetings at the, you know, release spots for Kanye's latest, you know, album. <laughs> so no, you know. so it's like, it's, it's the same space in which this sort of celebrity, mm. money, music pop culture um, kind of intersects. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, uh, yeah, we, we will leave it there for now and uh, be back in a second to talk about teachers. Hi, and welcome back. Our next data point is 3,197,000. That is the total number of public school teachers in the United States in 2021 that apparently is not enough school teachers, judging from reports of teacher shortages across the country in various districts. School districts across the country now trying to find ways to fill the gaps brought on by the pandemic and low pay. Nationwide, there are more than 280,000 fewer teachers now than at the start of the pandemic. That's according to the Department of Labor. And in addition to those teacher shortages, there are teacher strikes, specifically in Ohio right now, in, in the biggest school district in that state. This union representing more than 4,000 Columbus teachers and staff striking for the first time in roughly 50 years. A sign experts say of mounting frustration nationwide. That follows strikes in other states in previous years. So we thought we'd look at the broader economics of the teaching profession. So Adam... I guess the first question that came to mind was just this number of school teachers, over 3 million. Does that represent the largest group of public employees in the United States? And is that just generally true elsewhere in the world, that teachers are, are the number one sort of public employee? And is that kind of always been the case, that the education is just kind of such a core function of the state expressed in that way? I think it, I think it has been, certainly in the vast majority of Western states, and it's pretty typical um, that this labour intensive sector education dominates. It depends a little bit on how your healthcare system is organised, because in the United States, healthcare workers make up only about one million, slightly more than one million public employees, whereas in the United Kingdom, for instance, where the healthcare system is public, the balance will be different. But we underestimate the scale of the education system if we count only teachers, because the education system obviously employs a much larger group of people. Um, all, all told, it's about 7.7 .7 million people working in elementary and secondary schools in the United States. And if you then extend out to childcare, special needs education, and so on, the figure is even larger. If you add in higher education universities, you know we add another three million plus across the the entire sector in you know all all ranks of people working in the higher education system. So it's a huge sector. It really is. It's one of the largest sectors in any modern economy. And it's evolved over time, right? The principle of establishing public education uh, generally uh, is one that, that emerges out of the 18th century and, and begins to become firmly established in the process of state building in the 19th century. From the mid 19th century onwards, you do see this emergence of comprehensive public education across much of what will become the advanced economy world. And then the next big step and it's particularly dramatic in the United States, is really the 20th century explosion of secondary education. So schooling beyond the age of 11, 12, 13, through to ages 16 to 18, so preparatory to college, 
And this is where America really develops a spectacular advantage because between 1910 and the 1950s, the vast majority of American youth are enrolled in secondary schools, in high schools, in other words. It's not for nothing that the American cultural economic system invents the teenager, the phenomenon of the teenager with a particular cultural style, a particular pattern of consumption is an American creation. And it's an effect on the one hand of America's affluence and on the other hand of the fact that American teens are corralled into high schools much longer than any equivalent group of humans have ever been kept in an educational setting. So by the mid-1950s, 80% plus of American teenagers are still in education at a time where in Europe, the figure is maybe between 20 and 40% maximum. And so that's, as it were, how the education system expands to the scale that it currently has, because right now, roughly 50% of teachers are employed in elementary school and 50% are employed in secondary school. And that's how you end up with these really huge numbers. But it is a very relatively late process, a 20th century process of the incorporation of all of childhood as we understand it into the educational system, with the expectation in the US being of people leaving school really in their late teens, 17, 18, something like that. So how does America pay its teachers right now compared with the rest of the world? I mean, would more pay just be likely to solve the teacher shortage? Is, is it simple as that? I don't think there's any doubt that that is the basic problem. If you look at surveys of you know why people do not enter this inherently rewarding line of work, it's basically because of bad pay. The, the problem here is of comparisons because American wages are on the whole higher than other parts of the world. So if you simply ask the question, how are American teachers paid compared to their counterparts across, say, the OECD or any other comparable group of countries, America will emerge close to the top. But if you ask the question, how are American teachers paid relative to their counterparts with similar levels of college education, then America's teachers are shockingly underpaid relative to their peers in other countries. So all of a sudden, America goes from a relatively high paying country in the international comparisons to one in which you as a college graduate going into teaching suffer a worse penalty in America than you do in practically any other advanced economy in the world. Really, the only countries in which the penalty is even larger are countries like Slovakia or the Czech Republic, so former communist transition mm. countries where public employees are generally paid worse. But there is a huge gulf there between America, where teaching is an underpaid job, to comparison to countries where teaching is, in fact, a relatively high status job. And the gap is enormous. And it becomes really evident when you look at gender, because teaching was uh, throughout the 19th and 20th century, a job that was gendered female. And for women, until around 2000, teaching was still a line of work that paid better on average than the salaries that women commanded in the rest of the labor force, like for like, so for similar levels of education. For women, too, a penalty has now emerged to the tune of about 15 percent of like for like salaries for women with college education. For men, the gap is now 35 percent. So if you're a man leaving college and considering your career options, if you go down the route of teaching in the United States, you should expect to earn a third less than your counterparts in other lines of similar work. So that is a huge gap and is one of the reasons why, for sure, people at this point considering careers are wary about going into a sector which is as poorly paid as this. And, and that pay, of course, reflects a broader set of valuations and assumptions and priorities in American life in general. So there's active discussions going on in the United States of sort of allowing people without the necessary credentials to start teaching basically people with other backgrounds, other previous lines of work to invite them to apply and to become teachers. I know the city of Berlin here has already been doing something like that for years. There's been a teacher shortage here and they have a word for describing people who come in through the side door, quer Einsteiger. Is there data, Adam, on whether a kind of a lack of qualifications impedes the learning of children in measurable ways? There is, because this is a hugely controversial area, and we should say that up front. Since the late 90s, early 2000s, there's been a variety of different experiments with Teach for America, for instance, which is a program that welcomes recent graduates into the classroom without the need for a specific teaching certification, or in a city like New York, so-called teaching fellowship schemes, which are precisely that kind of model of experience, people in mid-career deciding to, to shift. 
This has been experimented with around the world. And as you'd expect, it's hugely controversial amongst those who are committed to a more professionalized model of education who don't believe that it is true that anyone can teach, they just need to know their subject matter, right? Who actually believe that the business of teaching is quite complex and requires a specific set of skills that need to be acquired and trained in places like teachers' colleges. And so there's been a lot of work trying to disentangle the effects. And I don't think there's much doubt that if you compare you know, these parachuted in inexperienced teachers to high quality experienced teachers in congenial classroom settings, the results are worse. The question is, however, how much the uh, confounding factors here. And once you remove, A, the quality of the classroom in which these people are being deployed, and many of the parachuted in non-certified teachers are being used in the toughest classrooms because that's where the problem is largest. Once you adjust for the experience level, so compare an unqualified teacher with a certified teacher with the same level of experience, And then finally, you adjust for the educational performance and background of the candidates, right? So many of the Teach for America fellows, for instance, are coming from extremely elite college backgrounds. And they are to that level, you know, at that level, as it were, maybe you can put this crudely, but smarter. I mean, that's a crass thing to say, but these are people with outstanding uh, degrees from outstanding universities and incredibly high SAT scores. So once you adjust for all of that, the picture is much muddier. And the use of, as it were, supplementary teachers without the necessary certification can be justified as a kind of emergency expedient measure. But what New York, for instance, attempted to do in the 2000s was to ensure precisely that it wasn't the least qualified, least experienced teachers, however enthusiastic and however brilliant their college records may be, that were parachuted into the toughest schools with the kids who were struggling with the most disadvantage, because that was a recipe for failure. So what they tried to do, as it were, was to adjust the proportion of teachers of each different type to equalize that across the New York City education system. And once you did that, you began to achieve a kind of degree of parity and indeed some degree of uplift in the least um, favored schools within the system. So it's a very delicate balance. And the evidence on this is mixed and highly contentious. Because, because the interests of an entire profession are at stake in this claim that really anyone can teach. They just need to know their subject and be properly motivated. Finally, I wanted to ask about teacher strikes that I mentioned at the top. As I said, Ohio is seeing ongoing teacher strikes that may carry over into the start of the school year. I was wondering about the kind of logic of strikes in public service jobs. I mean, in the public sector, there are no profits to share in that sense. And you could also say the public sector employer is the taxpayer who may or may not have a seat at the table in these kinds of negotiations. So yeah, is there a kind of fundamental difference between public sector versus private sector strikes? Yeah, I mean, it's really worth thinking about this, isn't it? I mean, ideal, typically, you'd say that a strike, a classic strike is a weapon, a bargaining tool used by collectively organized workers against a profit driven capitalist employer who derives profit by selling a commodity whose only value is whatever it commands on the market. Um, And workers do this to increase their share of the revenue, to squeeze profits uh, in favor of wages, to improve conditions, or even gain a degree of control over over the business in some broader sense, right? An ideal, typically, education is a non-market process. No one is making something for sale. The teachers are there to educate our children collectively. We all collectively value the process. And teachers are driven by a sense of vocation and by the esteem um, which their extraordinarily important work merits. And there might still, even in that ideal typical situation, be a logic to joining a union because a union is a way of expressing solidarity and collegiality with your fellow workers. But what would be the purpose of striking, I think, if, 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 if that was our world? So I think the short answer to the logic of the current strikes is that that isn't our world. That for large numbers of teachers in large numbers of places, that's no longer an even remotely plausible description of their situation. Hmm. They're undervalued. They're under-resourced. On a daily basis in the classroom, they're struggling to cope with the fallout from the dysfunctions of the societies in which their schools are located. They do so you know, often without much cooperation from parents whose absence from the picture is a huge part of the problem. And they deal with employers who are tough bureaucrats, not caring educators, and um, treat them as a resource that is just to be deployed in various ways. So at certain points, 
teachers feel forced, like other workers, to resort to the kind of desperate, high-risk action that is a strike, because a strike is a desperate, high-risk action. I mean, you can dress it up as some kind of carnival if you want, but in principle, you know, this is this is a very abnormal measure to have to engage in. Uh, and they do it for themselves, uh, but also for the system that they're absolutely essential to, right? They, they are indeed demanding attention. It's a, it's a more, frankly, political act, because as you say, mm. ultimately, it's the taxpayers that have to agree to raise the budgets and the scandal of the underfunding of public education in so many parts of the world, and in the United States in particular, is that tacitly, without really ever having to own what they're doing, taxpayers are refusing adequately to provide for their children and the adults and the professionals that are charged with taking care of and raising their children. They're basically shortchanging their own children. You know, some do that consistently by opting out of the system altogether. You know, the, the, the very well off can afford private education and, you know, at least they're consistent. But the broader mass of the electorate are simply choosing not to prioritise this essential function. And so the strike in that sense serves as a kind of political wake up call, which is that, you know, the teachers are saying, look, this system is broken. It's radically broken in many parts of the United States and desperately needs more adequate funding. And so we're willing to take this measure. It's kind of like calling a timeout, basically, you know, hmm. and saying, like, folks, timeout. We need to talk about education. That's fascinating. Yeah. I mean, this is the way you're describing that is clarifying because it's the, the relationship between the actors here is not necessarily adversarial mm. at all in the kind of classic capitalist sense. I mean, the, even the kind of labor we're talking about is not capitalist labor, but none of that suggests that a strike isn't necessary. It's just a different kind of action. It's a, yeah, discursive uh, 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 rather than, yeah. yeah, kind of. It really is. I think it's a, it's a form of a political intervention, like a protest, essentially. I was going to ask, when did you take your first economics course? In England uh, at A-level, so the final two years of, of high school. Mm, yeah, my high school economics teacher was explicitly patriotic, flag-waving. Mm. Mr. Haig yeah, <laughs> did teach the basics, but uh, did not uh, get into the finer points, I think, in any case. Well, I'll um, give a, if, if, we're, if we're naming names, I'll give a shout out to Mr. and Matt. Uh, <laughs> at the school I was at, who I mean, may listen to the podcast, and if he does, uh, uh, here's to you because uh, I, I had a good time at, in the final two years in economics. Cheers to all public school teachers out there doing the hard work. Indeed, yeah. We will leave it there then for now. Ones and Twos is written and edited by me, Cameron Abadi, along with Adam Twos. It is produced by Laura Rossbrow Tellum and Rob Sachs. Our social media manager is Claudia Tady. The executive editor of FP Podcasts is Dan Efron. So, we got one million downloads recently, and to celebrate, we are doing a little giveaway. Follow the link at the top of our Twitter profile, Ones and Twos Pod. We'll pick five lucky listeners to receive limited edition Ones and Twos stickers. This show is made possible through the support of foreign policy readers. If you're interested not just in Adam Tooze, but news and analysis from around the world, consider subscribing. Ones and Twos listeners even get a 15% discount. Just go to foreignpolicy.com slash subscribe and use the promo code Tooze at checkout. That is T-O-O-Z-E. Thanks very much for listening, and we will see you back in your feed next week.